Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today's guest is an entrepreneur who started a community growth platform called Orbit, which is an online community growth engine that drives growth. With Orbit's single shared view of membership and activities, communities can create cohesive messaging. It also has a reporting system to gauge the impact and prove return on investment. One area I saw this platform performing well is employee resource groups, also known as ERGs. What is an ERG? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Employee resource groups are groups of employees who join their workplace based on shared characteristics or life experiences. ERGs are generally based on providing support, enhancing career development, and contributing to personal development in work environments. In my experience, an ERG provides resources for learning and development support through formal and informal opportunities by creating employee networking activities. These networking activities do not have to simply come from one employer. In fact, I am one of the co-founding members of the Oregon Health and Science University Latino Employee Resource Group. The group was officially formed 10 years ago, almost to the day in 2012. Since then, our OHSU ERG has grown over 200 members and has just as many subscribers to our newsletter. Furthermore, I've recently established the Pacific Northwest Latino ERG Consortium, which is the collection of ERGs for other organizations throughout the state of Oregon. Those organizations include, but not limited to, Airbnb, Nike, Adidas, Moda, Cambia Health Solution, and many more. The intent behind the creation of the Pacific Northwest ERG Consortium is to share best practices between our groups. You see, ERGs are not only about networking and leadership development. It is also about being a resource for decision makers and leadership concerning the structure of organizational policies, staffing, community needs and concerns, brand awareness, and that is why ERGs are important. However, one of the biggest pieces that is needed in order to have successful ERG is securing executive support. One way I gained executive support was making bullet points with supporting data highlighting the benefits of an ERG. According to Sequela Consulting Group's 2021 Employee Experience Benchmarking Report, 40% of the companies have employee resource groups and 9% increased in 2020. This is in line with the uptick in diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, initiatives as a pandemic and racial injustice awareness created new challenges and opportunities for employers to evolve their employee existence, according to Sequilla officials. DEI has been researched time and time again, and the data always supports diversity. In 2020, McKinsey and Company, a global management consulting company, did a study called Diversity Wins, How Inclusion Matters. In that study, McKinsey and company found that diverse companies are more likely to financially outperform their peers. In that same study, McKinsey and company found one third of its forms they tracked since 2014 had achieved real gains in executive team diversity. However, about 50% have made little or no progress. And with that, many have seen gender and ethnic minority representations even go backwards. Another point this study made Promoting diversity does not ensure a culture of inclusion, and that is why the entrepreneur should care. As I've stated time and time again, I work in healthcare. If you look across the healthcare industry, you will see many hospitals failing financially right now. Although there are many factors, one issue hospitals are facing right now is staffing. There are not enough American-born workers taking up health care as a profession, creating a huge staffing hole for our aging population. In turn, health care systems are turning to nurses beyond our country's borders to bring in health care staffing to support our community needs. In Oregon, 20% of licensed health care workers speak another language according to the Oregon Health Needs Assessment. ERGs are not simply about diversity and cultures. They are about the diversity in our communities. At OHSU, we have over 10 different ERGs, from OHSU Pride to Veterans to International to the Older Employee Resource Group. Any staff member can join an ERG to understand what issues other communities are facing. It is about creating awareness and opportunity through fairness and transparency. It is about fostering a multicultural, diverse organization as diverse as our communities, our communities of entrepreneurs. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. All 
will be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. successful teams at Keen, IO, and Figure 8. He is the host of Developer Love Podcast and co-creator of Orbit One. Please welcome Patrick Wood. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have the founder of Orbit, Patrick Wood. Patrick, how are we doing? Hey, Gabriel. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Very excited to be here. Um, doing doing pretty great and excited to have this conversation. Yes. But now before we hear about Orbit, let's hear about Patrick. Who is Patrick Woods? Give the audience a little bit of background. <laughs> You know, as a founder, it's hard to separate myself from the, the company. Um, <laughs> so it's hard to describe one without the other, I would say. But um, yeah, and Patrick, I'm the, the co-founder and CEO of Orbit. Um, you know, my career blends uh, a few different chapters, sort of grew up in digital marketing, uh, worked in an ad agency for a while, uh, transitioned from kind of the digital analytics side of the agency to doing brand strategy. Uh, at, at that agency, I uh, created a business unit to focus on startups. So essentially providing services for equity. Think like naming services, brand design, things like that for early stage companies. Uh, but instead of you know, getting paid cash, we got paid in terms of equity. Um, that introduced me to the whole wonderful world of startups. Um, one of my clients was a company called Keen.io. Uh, Keen was an analytics API, kind of an early stage company, Sequoia Vax, you know, just classic you know, developer driven, bottom up, community led kind of a company. And uh, Keen was a client and they recruited me to be their, their director of customer success because they had lots of users, lots of customers, and no one looking after them. And that was a big part of my job at the agency. So I uh, moved from Memphis, Tennessee, where I, where I grew up, um, moved to San Francisco to join Keen, and really joined the, um, you know, the, the, startup, the startup, you know, joyride, if you will. Uh, so it was at Keen for a while, learned a lot about community as a driver of value for both the business and the community members. Uh, Keen had probably around 50,000 developers on the platform. So tons of people building cool stuff and talking to each other about what they were building. Uh, after Keen, I went to a company called Figure 8 in the machine learning space. And then uh, around 2018, uh, I, I got the band back together with my now co-founder, Josh. Uh, Josh was the VP of engineering at, at Keen IO. And we started doing some consulting in kind of the developer relations, developer community space, uh, just really helping companies accelerate their 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 programming there and, and be more thoughtful and strategic. And Really, that sort of led to the modern era of Orbit because a couple of things happened during that time. One was that we spent time with, you know, dozens of companies, hundreds of leaders in the space, and we realized everyone was, you know, all of these companies were investing in community programs and didn't know how to measure the sort of efficacy of those programs because it seems very nebulous. And um, this will sound a bit philosophical, but the the sort of sole commercial metaphor for measuring things in business since. 1888 essentially has been the sales and marketing funnel, or maybe 1898. Uh, but but suffice it to say that the the funnel as a metaphor is is great for optimizing a linear linear process like a like a product onboarding or enterprise sale. Uh, but community growth, community is not linear; it's not binary. And so we realized that it's really hard to measure community with the funnel. So we took a step back and we created a framework called the Orbit Model, which said this is this is the way you can measure organically the way communities expand and grow and fade over time. And um, we sort of launched that as a blog post, kind of as quote unquote thought leadership for the consulting practice, but it really hit a nerve with, with our audience. And so people started to say, cool blog post, how, how do we do it? How do we take these, these, this theory and turn it into practice? Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we did was we, we fleshed out the concepts. We, we put some of the, the underlying math into some Airtable templates. We had a small Slack community of our own. And then with that, we sort of raised our first uh, pre-seed capital in late 2019 before we had a product. So we were pre-product. We basically just said that, look, the, the way people buy software and buy most things has shifted from a, a top-down sales motion to a bottom-up adoption-centric motion. And the tooling for, for managing that process 
hasn't really hasn't really been born yet. Like all the existing tools in the enterprise are very premised on a buyer, a seller, and sort of a, sort of a transaction. And so, you know, our, our our premise was that we need to reimagine the the go to market from the bottoms up. Uh, from the ground up in the context of an adoption center go-to-market, but we've got to build it on top of better data models and better mental models. And so that that's sort of the, the story of how we went from kind of like early ideas into building, you know, launching Orbit. So yeah, we launched in 2019, uh, or we, we started in 2019. We, we launched publicly about a year ago, May of, May of last year. Um, today we have many thousands of, of customers, some pretty great ones like Stripe, Okta, Patreon, Miro, Vercel, uh, and, a, and a number of others that are sort of very community-led, community-driven companies, primarily in the software space, um, as well as a lot of growth in Web3, gaming, uh, and e-commerce as well. So yeah, basically at the end of the day, we, we help our, our companies, our, our customers really understand who's in their community and what to do about it. So yeah, so I've been thinking about this stuff for, <laughs> for a while, uh, as, as you can tell. Um, in addition to the stuff we did at Keen, I've, I've produced events in the past, you know, hosted you know, monthly meetups and, and dinners and things like that. So I've um, been thinking for a long time about how communities impact the people in them, but also the sort of like bigger business they might be associated with. So so just to kind of clarify, Orbit in itself is, is kind of a, a digital platform to create communities, kind of correct? Is that, is that summarize it? Or please maybe, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. So um Basically, all of our customers share a couple of things in common. Um, one is that their community is is important. Uh, it happens online, and it happens across a bunch of different channels. And right. So, a typical Orbit customer will they'll have activity happening on GitHub plus a Discord server plus Twitter plus Meetup plus Product Hunt plus Reddit, and you just sort of like the list goes on about where where these conversations, where these interactions are happening, and so. On one hand, the community is super important. On the other hand, it's distributed across dozens of unending number of places. And so sort of at the, at the, the bottom of the hierarchy of needs, if you will, what we do is we make it really easy for our customers to connect all those data sources and get a single view of, of what's going on across those channels. So at the individual level, you can see, okay, a month ago, this person uh, followed us on Twitter. And then the next day, they subscribed to our newsletter. And then two days later, they came to our Discord forum asked a bunch of questions about the product, and then the next day downloaded a free trial and started using the product. And then a month later, you know, referred a friend. And so really it's, it's this idea of taking all these disparate data points that are spread across these different channels and across the product and unifying it into a single view. And so at the individual level, you see, you see the full journey. Uh, what it means is that as a second order effect, you have that individual data that then rolls up into company-wide data. So Orbit can say, hey, did you know that last week there were eight people from Acme active in your in your orbit you know two followed you on twitter another came to the meetup another one requested a copy of the pdf and without a tool like orbit you probably wouldn't know because it happens across a bunch of platforms so right, it makes right, it really right. helpful to understand which organizations are engaging in and there's a bunch of reporting that, that comes out of that and then some workflow automations some messaging some things like that now you mentioned one of my favorite things you mentioned data <laughs> i love getting into data i love kind of scrubbing data where do you you mentioned getting your data sets where do you get these data sets with this information and what kind of information does it kind of have just to give the listeners a just general idea of what you're, what you're kind of looking at and analyzing? Yeah. So the, the two, the two main concepts in, in an orbit workspace. So if you were going to use orbit today, you would go to orbit.love, you would create an account, create a workspace and inside a workspace, we, we keep up with the, the community members themselves. So this is an individual. So this is Patrick Woods, um, a, a member has various identities. So I'm Patrick J. Woods on Twitter. I'm Patrick J. Woods on GitHub. And then members do activities. And this is kind of like the, the, one of the fundamental differences between Orbit and a, like a traditional sales CRM is because we found that modern businesses want to know what people are doing across channels. And so right. an activity right. is any verb that someone does. So it could be followed on Twitter. It could be joined the forum. And you can basically imagine anything. And so how do we get the data? So uh, there's a couple of ways. The most common way is using one of our 20 or so integrations that we built. So uh, the, the, the Twitter integration, for example, is under the hood. It's a Twitter app. So you, you click connect in the Orbit workspace. It goes to Twitter. You authorize the app into your Twitter account. And then we go and pull in uh, you know, recent mentions, recent follows, things like that. And going forward, anytime someone follows you, anytime someone retweets you, mentions you, mentions a specific keyword that you want to keep track of, that creates an activity in your workspace. And so 
the, the, the member is, you know, Patrick J. Wood, the activity is follow Gabriel on Twitter. And so every integration does something similar. So for the Discord, the Discord integration, the Discord bot, it sits on your server. When people join, when people um, ask questions in specific channels, when they reply to threads, those are all activities on GitHub. There's a number. Um, and so basically, you think about any platform like like on Meetup, it would be RSVP for an event. And so in the, the, basically, the initial phase of an Orbit you know experience is connecting these data sources using our integration. So typical implementation process takes 10 minutes, could be longer. Um, aside from the integrations, we also have a, a Zapier app and a, a Make app, if you're familiar with Make. So we, you know, really lean into the low-code, no-code sort of part of the world. And then underneath all that, we have we have an API and webhooks. So our bigger customers build some pretty complex workflows. And the beauty of it is the customers see absolutely none of this because it's kind of all operated in the background, correct? Yeah, it's it's similar to any other kind of like marketing sales tool. It's it's behind the scenes, so it doesn't require anything from the end user. Um, to do, you know, to, to, to have to sign up or anything like that. It just happens automatically uh, based on basically the public inter- interactions that are happening. Now you mentioned, you know, you recently kind of just started the business. Let's talk about, you know, how you started the business and the financing part. Is it a grassroots effort? Did you go venture capital? How, how did you start to finance this company? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're venture backed. So um, we, we raised a few different rounds. The first one, uh, as mentioned, was, it was a pre-seed. Uh, so it was, you know, shy of a million dollars basically and the, the that phase was basically you know can we go and prove out the demand for a tool like this because the, the sort of vision for orbit at the time there's nothing really like it in the market and so the first question is is there is there a market here what should the product look like and then can patrick and josh go build it <laughs> and convince people to, to use the early version so um we started in late 2019 uh of course 2020 was the sort of beginning of the pandemic. And so the first half of 2020 was, um, you know, very chaotic, like it was for everyone. But one, one thing that we, we experienced was that because of COVID, because of the shutdowns, basically every company's event marketing budget and events programs sort of went away. And so there's no more conferences, there's no more meetups. And so every company moved everything online. And all of a sudden, the world is wondering, how do we track and measure this engagement across all these different channels? We all suddenly have to do community online and we don't know how to do that. And so that was very helpful for our business because it just drove a ton of demand. Um, we've, we ha- we've done very little, you know, paid advertising promotion. It's pretty much all been organic community driven based on sort of those tailwinds from the market. So um, I guess late 2020, we, we raised a, a seed round from Andreessen Horowitz uh, and then early 2021 did a series A from Code2 uh, that A16Z participated in. Yeah, and then went, went live middle of last year. So, but yeah, we've been venture back the, the whole way. Now, one of the things you mentioned was pre-seed. For the, for the listeners at home, can you, that may not be familiar with venture capital and going through that process, what does pre-seed mean? Sure. So the, the, historically, each sort of round of capital that a, that a company would raise um, would have a couple of factors associated with it. Basically, how much the company is raising, the valuation of the company, and then sort of the, the maturity milestones for every phase, if you will. So, um, you know, today, and these, as you can imagine, are sort of fluid over time. Every decade, sort of, there's a bit of a reset. Um, a, pre, a pre-seed has historically been, you know, let's let's raise somewhere between 250 and 750, you know, a million kind of on the high end um, to fund a team to go to do like the basic research around the problem set and, and, and basically de-risk a few things. De-risk the, the execution. So like, can the founders build it? Um, can they can they can they find something that looks like it's going to work? You know, of course, at the very early stages, no one's expecting ARR or, or you know recurring revenue at that point. Um, but it's it's basically the 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 investors and the founders basically saying, yeah, like we think there's something here, we really need to go focus on it. We need some capital to go do that. So let's figure it out. So the next phase, you know, typically when you've done a pre-seed, and some companies don't do a pre-seed. Sometimes you just raise a seed round, but a seed round is typically I mean, and it's, it's been very different, honestly, from 2021 to 2022 in terms of like the round sizes. So over the past couple of years, the seed round might be two to six. We saw some big ones last year, like eight to 10, which is pretty out of whack with historical ranges. Um, but at the seed, it's, it's, it's like, okay, we need to start to build a team around this uh, because there's, there's some demand here. There's some pull in the market. We've got, we've got sort of, you probably have like a, a beta version of the software, you know, maybe you have some design partners you're working with. You've got, a few dozen, maybe a hundred people using it, getting value. And so you could have proven out the, the minimum viable product. There's, 
you can build it. There's people that want it. Maybe you've got some revenue, often not. Uh, but really now that the, you've de-risked the early parts. And so now you need to de-risk the, you know, can you build a team? Can you, can you start to drive revenue? Can you start to test some good in the market? Can you build a community? Um, and then by the time you get to the Series A, the, the Series A is kind of like the bigger round. It can be 10 to 15 to 20 or more. Um, you know, by then it's like, okay, let's, you need to be getting to revenue, approaching a million dollars in ARR. And then, so basically every stage has kind of like investor expectations from it, kind of like what you need to do with the money um, and kind of milestones that you are signing up for essentially for the next, the next round of funding. So yeah, they just call it like series, series C to series A, B, C is kind of just the shorthand that the investor people use to demark what, what round we're at and what stage the company at. What would you say are some of the difficulties kind of like maybe some aha moments going through the venture round that you're like, wow, I didn't expect that. Or maybe some difficulties that your team ran into trying to raise funds. Yeah. Well, we, on one hand, we, we had a lot of, uh, we were very lucky to be raising capital in the, in the prior market. I mean, it was just the economy was flush with cash. And so um, I, I would say some of the lessons we learned is that, that there's, there's a, a degree of interpretation required around investor feedback. There's an interesting thing that, that I've observed where an investor is, they, they, they're the business of essentially gathering as much information as they can. You know, so they'll ask you a lot of questions about your market, your market size, your customers, key problems, who else you're seeing in the market. And they're, they're information gathering machines. And so that, that is useful. You know, there's almost always upside for an investor in a, in a conversation because they're collecting data, they're putting that data in spreadsheets. The firm is crunching that data to figure out which companies to invest in, which markets to go into. So there's there's not always a, there's always semester value into in a conversation. So they're always asking questions, getting information. The other thing is that they're they're always trying to keep the option open to to actually do the investment. And so um, it's almost it's it's sort of like dating in a weird way, where the first <laughs> conversation like it feels really good, everything's going great. You know, they're saying this is awesome, we're really excited, and then they're, they're very excited until they're not, until they break up. You know, like all of a sudden they send you an email that says, well, you know, the market's not big enough, you're not far enough along, whatever, whatever. There's all these reasons they give you that they never mentioned before. They, 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 until this point, until the breakup, it's just like flattery because they want to keep the option open as long as possible to yeah, do the deal or not makes sense. until the last minute. And so uh, I experienced early on a lot of whiplash from that because, you know, you, you build a relationship, you invest time, you're like, oh, this is, this person really gets the business this is going to be a great partner. And then all of a sudden they have all these objections they really hadn't mentioned until it's too late. And so it, I found that it's, it's not very, it's not usually a conversation that's very transparent on either side. You know, like if, if VCs have questions maybe about, you know, market sizing or burn rate or things like that, they often don't ask them because they, and it, they don't want to like turn you off as a founder because often, you know, you're talking as a founder to, to multiple investors. And so, you know, there's a, there's a some fear from VCs that I've picked up on that if they're too direct to do a little feedback, then maybe you, you know, they hurt your feelings and you take the money from someone else. And it's like this really strange dynamic, hmm. but as a founder, you know, you you're like, you really just want the information, you know, like, <laughs> and, and in fact, you really come to value people that will tell you the truth. Yeah, good point. Good point. It's all we have. Like we have to make decisions based on the data we have. And, you know, so that's some of those challenges are pretty, were pretty interesting. Uh, and trying to read the tea leaves of, what people are really saying behind the things they're actually saying. Yeah. You got to always read between the lines kind of thing. Now, what would you say was yeah. like possibly like the easier part about it or was there anything easy about going through that rounds, going through those seed rounds? Um, you know, we, we've been very lucky, I would say to, to have an interesting product at the right time. The market's been good. Um, we live in San Francisco or other than San Francisco, my co-founder Josh, she lives in Paris, but, We've both been in startup world for a long time. So we, we've been fortunate enough to have just a really great network of, of people that, you know, both angel investors as well, both angel investors as well as institutional you know, venture capitalists. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're pretty privileged in that, in that regard. So it's not, it's not been easy, but I think it's probably been a lot easier than, for, than it's been for a lot of people simply because we're one degree of separation away from a lot of people. So, um, but that's just, there's not really any advice in that one, I guess, other than maybe geographical proximity, proximity to, to capital is still, I think, really important. You know, actually, you brought up one point that I think that's kind of important that, you know, um, indirectly, and that, that is networking. 
right? You're talking about your network, right? Of your individuals that you know and, and your partner knows. How important has your network been to building, you know, these companies? You, you mentioned Orbit's actually not your first one. How important has your network been to kind of grow yourself as an entrepreneur? Oh, yeah. it's It's been maybe not everything, but boy, it's been a lot. I mean, it's we can credit our network with um, early capital. So our, our first our first angel investor, the first person who wrote any, committed any dollars to Orbit was uh, a guy named James Stample. And James was the founder of Firebase. Firebase had a pretty massive exit to Google. Um, James is a, a friend of my co-founder. He's a friend of mine now, but he was a longtime friend of Josh, my co-founder. They have a Burning Man camp together for the past many, many years. And so, God, you know, it's like it. we're getting started. It's like a couple of calls and James is in for his for his check size. And so then we can go to other people and say, look, James is in, he's a big deal. Like you should be in. And it's sort of that first check just unlocks everything. And so it was complete from the network. And, you know, not only was it just in, in the case of James and a lot of our early investors, it's not just, just any money, it's money from people that also have networks. Yeah. And yeah. so it's, it's multiplicative. And so, yeah, we've, we've benefited a lot from the early investment in those relationships and trying to keep those warm and just meeting people. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like the classic serendipity thing. You just, you never know. Like you go to yeah, a meetup, certainly. you run into someone five years later, you know, they're, they're your VC, you know, it's just, and so a place like San Francisco is still pretty good because there's so much density around, around that. Now, of course, online is, there's plenty of things that are happening online too. And increasingly capital is distributed, but regardless of whether it's in person or not, I mean, investing in, in the network, um, it's like, there's, there's no downside. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's one thing that's been, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's one thing that has been common throughout this podcast is just highlighting networking and, and the importance of networking. And and it's not like what you know, it's who you know a lot of the time because those individuals, you know, I say this often when you're climbing up this, you know, so to speak, corporate ladder and you're reaching down and helping other people's up, eventually we might slip and fall down that corporate ladder, but it's those individuals that have been you know, we've been helping up along the way. They're going to kind of reach out to prevent you from falling even further kind of thing. And so it's, it's interesting how the networking is, is, is such a kind of a big thing. In fact, if, if James ever needs somebody to join him at Burning Man, please do let me know. I'm always available. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Patrick, <laughs> what motivates you? I mean, you're, you're grinding, you're doing quite a bit. What motivates you to keep going? I, I think it's a, a few things. Uh, it's, the chance for, for impact, I think, is, is maybe the, the highest level bucket. And that, I think there's probably a couple of couple parts of that. Um, I feel pretty fortunate to be able to, to do this, to have a startup, to have raised money from amazing investors, to have really incredible customers, you know. Um, and so it's pretty motivating to have some of the, some of the most interesting companies using our, our tools and saying, yeah, this is, this is helpful. I'm improving outcomes for the business. I'm helping the community grow. I've become a rock star. Um, so I'm not sure what's like under that. <laughs> maybe there's probably some deeper Freudian motivation here maybe, but I think, I think the, just the chance to, to go do that. I don't know. Like building a startup has been a thing I've wanted to do for a long time. And so like, I, I feel very motivated by the chance to build, build a thing that has big impact, um, both in terms of creating a category, building a business, employing a lot of really amazing people. Um, I think I think the, the the team aspect of it is pretty motivating for me. Uh, our, our team is spread across the U.S., uh, the U.K., France, and uh, a couple of West African companies, uh, countries, um, Benin, uh, namely, uh, and um, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, or excuse me, Nigeria. And it's it's an incredible group of people that are all thoughtful, kind, super intelligent. And so, you know, to be able to have a team of people that I learn from, I'm inspired by is, is pretty awesome. And of course to have the chance to mold and shape that culture versus being like part of something else, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, it's nice to be the, I don't know, be in charge, I guess, <laughs> when it comes to that sort of stuff and kind of create the kind of place that, that I want to work and Josh wants to work. So that's a pretty huge as yeah. well. Um, and what we're seeing is that if, if a company has, they have a thriving community, it basically makes every other part of the business easier. It makes sales easier. It makes marketing easier. And, and for the community members, it means they're getting answers faster and they're meeting people and they're probably getting jobs. And so yeah. there's many like second and third order benefits to the outcome of communities getting bigger and better and healthier. So there's like a, like a long-term impact. I think it sounds kind of cheesy, but like on society, if we can help companies get better at this and scale this up, then I think it actually makes people's lives better because um, all the reasons I just described. 
You know, and I think too, where I see Orbit possibly um, leveraging, you know, the opportunity to kind of build into the corporate world is really focusing on the employee resource groups. Uh, because I think with larger institutions, there's a lot of employee resource groups. I know I'm part of one here at Oregon Health and Science University. I'm also uh, kind of uh, starting this kind of consolidation of employee resource employee resource group throughout the state of Oregon that we're trying to kind of create this cohesion between us all, kind of determine what are we doing. And this is exactly where I see Orbit kind of fitting in, right? Love to hear about what our ERG members, you know, Latino ERG members are doing four hours south you know, and it kind of still engaging in that community. Now, as a business owner, first, why startups? Why'd you get in the startup world? I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I have to really introspect on that. I, I would probably say the the speed that things happen has always been attractive. Okay, um, being able to take a being able to take a big swing really quickly uh, and know if something's going to work or not has has been attractive. Um, I think, you know, building something from scratch certainly isn't limited to, to the world of tech startup, but, um, you know, again, getting back to the impact thing, it seemed to me like the, the most efficient and effective way to, to build something quickly to have an impact, um, you know, versus maybe, I don't know, bootstrapping or, or, or doing something else. So, yeah, and I think that the culture around around st- the startup space has is, is always been attractive in the sense that it's a very, um, you know, Fast moving, people are smart. Uh, there's lots of open learning. You know, open source software is kind of like the sort of first version of this, but more and more people are um, publishing their learnings, like learning in the open, sharing what worked and what didn't, doing big retrospectives on this company didn't work out. Here's why, and you know, there's big a big bias towards towards learning, and that's that's always been really attractive to me too. So, I think those are those are some of the things, and I, I don't, just being surrounded by really smart people is always fun. Like I always blown away by the types of people I get to yeah. to meet and work with and even employ. And so it's kind of like the best place for, for somebody who wants to learn and just be surrounded by really <laughs> elite folks. Uh, it's kind of the best, the best place to do that in my, at least in my experience. Yeah. Now what advice would you have for the listeners at home? Oh, um, in general or with business or any, what, let's any, think, let's think from an entrepreneur's perspective, what, what advice would you have for an entrepreneur that maybe is thinking of getting in the startup world as well? I think, I think doing the work to, to get, get clarity on, you know, your, your individual motivation and like to your last question, I think that's, that's been pretty key. So, and this is actually one of the questions going back to the, James Tamplin, who I mentioned earlier, one of his first questions to us was like, why, like, why do you want to do this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was, he was a founder. He had been through the ringer. Um, he's like, are you sure? You know, like, like what's, do you think it's going to be easy? Do you, are you reading TechCrunch and think it's all just like raising big rounds of money and doing exits? Right, totally. Like, yeah. It's actually, it's actually really hard. So, you know, really doing a gut check on like, what is it I want to do and why? And is that, is that why I going to keep you going through the hard times? Because you know, it's, we, we've, we've seen many ups and downs in orbit. It was about three years old, um, coming up on three years, I guess. And, you know, we've been through COVID, we've been through a war, a recession, you know, the market's gotten hot, you know, competition shows up, you know, like, it's just like many ups and downs. People leave the company, you know, like for no, like for good reasons or bad reasons, whatever, you have to let people go. Yeah. And it's just a lot of stuff. And as a founder, you, it turns out that you know, the, the thing you want to do uh, I guess I'm kind of like just rambling a bit here, but I would say that, you know, what I found is that starting the idea of starting a company and building a product that's really cool um, is a great starting point. But as a CEO, you, you do a lot of stuff that's not building a cool product. Like yeah. you work on that some, but you also do a lot of, um, a lot of chores. Uh, it's funny. One thing Elon Musk said, and you know, we can say a lot of things about him, I guess, but you know, basically one of the things he said is like being a CEO is just, it's about doing your chores. And if you don't do them, it's going to be bad. <laughs> so yeah. you just got to like taxes, accounting, HR stuff. You know, there's a lot of that. So I guess it comes back to like understanding why you want to do the thing and then gut checking the sort of reality of, Hey, it's going to be, it's going to be a slog. And maybe talking to some people that have been there and done that. I mean, my, I think about my own network, the having connectivity with other founders who are both at my stage, like kind of like series A, but also people who are like further beyond it's really excellent to have those people share perspective because 
you know, investors are great. They'll try to give you advice and stuff like that. But really only a founder who's kind of been there and done that or is currently in those same trenches as you are can bring that same perspective. And so, you know, it's useful to just have a conversation with a few people that have done it before. And, you know, if, if, if you've never talked to anybody that's done a startup, talk to some people who have done one and make sure it's for you because um, it's not easy. Man, I keep telling you folks, network, get out there and talk to people, <laughs> right? Get out there and listen to their stories. It's, it's quite impressive how much you can learn from other people. I mean, you know, we're kind of at the best time in our life where we actually do have every possible knowledge, you know, at our fingertips. In fact, it's probably in our phone, in our pockets right now, right? Um, yeah. But also people uh, in, in books and just having that opportunity. Now, where where can the listeners find Orbit? If they're interested in the product, they're interested in kind of finding out more, where can they find you guys online and on the social media? Yeah, definitely. So our website is orbit.love. That's right, L-O-V-E. Um, it's kind of a funny funny domain name, but it's, it's there's a bigger brand story. So I mentioned the Orbit model we created early, you know, earlier in the call. By the way, you can read about the Orbit model at orbitmodel.com. But there are several parts of the Orbit model. There's gravity, there's reach, um, and there's a metric we call love. And we say love is the basically the, the recency, frequency, and quality of every person's interaction over time. And we actually measure that with the product, but it's part of the Orbit model sort of idea. So the website for the product is orbit.love. And it's always fun to tell people that because, you know, my email address is patrick at orbit.love. And then like it's a it. conversation about like, What's, what's the deal with that? And so yeah. we lean into that from a brand standpoint. So you can find us there. Um, we have lots of resources on our blog about community building, about, about tactics and tools and programs and best nice. practices. And, and um, we have a, a community of our own. Uh, it's predominantly community builders, founders, uh, developer advocates, folks like that. You can find us at discord.orbit.love. Uh, join in and sort of follow along. We do office hours, we do fireside chats in the server. It's really fun. Nice. Um, and then me, yeah. And then me personally, I'm just at Patrick J. Woods on Twitter. So I was happy to help founders just talk about, talk about these topics because uh, it's a, re- a rewarding journey, but a, but a tough one as well. Man. Yeah. No, you, you and I feel like you have a lot of, a uh, lot of experience to give a lot of individuals that are, that are seeking it. Thank you, uh, Patrick, T- Patrick Woods, man. Thank you so much. The co-founder of Orbit. I, I'm again, folks, if you're interested, please get online, check out the orbit dot orbit dot love. Uh, for, for more information, I've already been looking at the actual online because, again, Patrick, in fact, we'll probably chat a little bit after this because I think there is a, an area for Orbit in the ERG world. Uh, for those folks listening at home, please subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com or follow me at the Shades of E on all of the social sites, including TikTok. Yes, we finally got there, folks. We are on the TikTok. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.